Look around. If you see somebody missing, call them today and say, hey, one, two, three, on you. I missed you. Let them know we missed them. Because we do. And uh, let them know. Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today and will be for a while. Galatians 5, back when I was uh, looking at the year in January, I said to myself, and felt led, I need to revisit some stuff, and uh, that's where we're at. Galatians 5.22, unless you just want, I've got a song you want to sing, solo. Anybody, you just die and get up here and sing, by yourself. Okay. Well, if the Spirit's leading you, you need to get up and sing. <laughs> Boy, I got quiet in here. <laughs> Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Also notice the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to be there a while. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp into our feet. It's a light into our path. May you use it today to wake us up and get our attention and call us, Father, to a renewed hope in you, a new surrender in you, a new infilling with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to do a sermon series, and I'm starting it this morning on the fruit of the Spirit. I hope it's a blessing, and don't leave too many running for the door, but uh, you know that list. I know that list. We've read it through many times. Good Christians know this, but I just felt led, checked in my spirit to revisit this. You don't have to turn there, but in John 15, a parallel passage that goes with this, John 15, 8, Jesus said, Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciple. You can't read John 15 without noticing Jesus talked a lot about fruit. He talked about fruit. He talked about more fruit, and he talked about much fruit. And uh, that your fruit, pray that your fruit remain. And matter of fact, in another passage, he said, You'll know them by the fruits. You know, you get the idea that we're just called to be fruity people. But Jesus gave us the, the scoop on this, and you don't have to turn there, but listen, in John 15, 8, before we're done with this sermon series, we're going to be in John 15, but listen to this. He said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abide in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do how much? Nothing. Goose egg. Without Jesus, you can't pretend. You can't put on a dog. You can't act like. It don't work. You won't last. But if you abide in him, you bring forth much fruit. We're not talking about apples and oranges. We're talking about a Spirit-filled life where God comes with the Holy Spirit and empowers His people to live like, act like He did, and He is. It's qualities and characteristics of the life of Christ revealed in us through the Holy Spirit. And if you look at that list in verse 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. And that is what bears the fruit. It's not you and I saying, well, preacher, uh, I'll do a better job this coming week. Trust me. I've got this. I can do it. I, I, I. No. It's not you and I trying harder. It's you and I surrender to God. That, and, and God will bring forth the fruit in our life and He will cause it to grow and manifest in us because we are surrendered to Him. It is Christ in you. It is so much that we are like that tree in Psalms 1 planted by the rivers of water that uh, brings forth its fruit in season. His leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he does is prosperous, uh, meaning that his sap never goes down. 
That tree is always flourishing. That's the picture of a spirit-filled Christian who is living and abiding in Christ, and God is using them. I've always enjoyed that little story by Stuart Briscoe. It's a little book I've got on my shelf at home called Spirit Life. And he tells about a guy that he knew well that related this story to him when he was just a little boy that there was a tree growing up against the side of a house and especially there was one big limb there by his bedroom window. And whenever that boy got banished to his bedroom, he didn't care at all about being sent to his room because he could raise the wind and he could go out on that one big branch and skinny down that tree and be out in the backyard and off to his friend's house and play. And uh, he didn't care if he got sent to his bedroom because of that tree. And one day dad said, you know, that old fruit tree hasn't bore fruit for years. I'm just going to have the thing cut down. And he went into panic mode because that was his escape ladder. You know, and he didn't know what he was going to do. So him and his brother got to come up with a plan. And according to the story, said that uh, later that day, somehow they got their hands on a box full of apples. And uh, late that night, under the cloak of darkness, they went out there on that tree when mom and dad's in bed, and they tied these apples all over that tree, and uh, so that their dad would not cut the tree down. Next morning, with bated breath, they're waiting to see what dad says and what happens. And uh, They've done their work, and Dad steps out on the porch early that morning, and all of a sudden he calls to his wife, Mary, Mary, you'll never believe it. It's a miracle that the old tree is now, is now bore fruit overnight. It's a miracle. It's covered in apples, and it's a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> Folks, this fruit we're talking about is not trickery. Uh, this is not charades. This is not play acting. The, I, the preacher's not trying to talk you into something that's not possible. This is real. Amen. This is real because the power of God in you can transform your life and make you just like this. The minute somebody is born again, the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit's been working on your life long before you get saved, okay? It's the Holy Spirit that awakens somebody and makes them realize, I need Jesus. I'm lost and headed for hell. I, I, need, I need Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that wakes them up. Like the prodigal son that said, I will arise and go to my father's house. Even my father's servant's got a better life than what I've got. It's the Holy Spirit to awaken somebody that, breaks their conscience, that convicts them of sin, that they say, I need Jesus. <clears throat> it's the Holy Spirit that's engaged in, in, in the actual act of somebody being saved. And it's the Holy Spirit, therefore, in the rest of your life that's drawing you, maturing you, helping you be more like Jesus. <clears throat> and the minute somebody gets saved, th there's a change in their life. And people at work notice, and people that live across the street notice, and, and people in your family that live under your roof notice, there's something different in that cat. There's something different in them. Mom's different. Dad's different. Kids are different. Why? It's the Holy Spirit in their life that makes them loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, gentle, good, faithful, meek, self-controlled. That is the work of God in our life, and it don't take 20 years for that to show up. I mean, just within minutes, people notice, man, what happened to them? We also believe that there is the work of sanctification where there is a cleansing of the heart and there is an empowering where, where Christians now are empowered to live a godly life. It's the difference of Romans 7 versus Romans 8. Romans 7, it's like, God, help me, I want to live like that, but I'm struggling. In Romans 8, it's the Spirit-filled life. What a transformation where God empowers your people. Now, we're going to work through all nine of these, but not today. We're going to work on one for a little bit. Got a long intro here to this message, but, you know, if you ever get the plane off the ground, you know, we'll do all right. The first one I want to talk to you is the one, number one, right here in the list. Line item number one is love. And some people say that, that, that all the fruit of the Spirit is really love anyway. That that is, what well, Paul said, the greatest of these is love. Jesus said, herein shall 
All men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. All your strength. And He threw in, and oh, by the way, there's this thing called a neighbor. <laughs> and, you, and you need to love Him too. And as we say, uh, God loves you and I'm trying. Well, we, you know, we, we, we're called to love. And, and, and if we are surrendered to the Lord, this fruit will bear fruit out in our life because the Holy Spirit is at work to make us this way. Some say that the fruit of the Spirit is really just love. And, and the rest of the list, the other eight words are just what love looks like. Love is joyous and love is peaceful and love is long-suffering and love is gentleness and love is good and faithful and meek and self-controlled. And, and if you've read 1 Corinthians 13, boy, don't that sound familiar. That is, that, that, that all of this is really what love looks like lived out in Shula. Sometimes you run out of words to say what love looks like. Jesus used stories. Jesus used the story of the shepherd that leaves the sheep and goes out and looks for the one that is lost and out into the highways and the byways and into the weather to find the one that's lost. That is the love of God. It's a picture of the father standing waiting for the son that's went out and lived like hell and the father still loves and cares and welcomes him back when he comes back in. I think it's a picture of the sower who sows seed and it doesn't matter what kind of soil it is. It all gets the seed. That is the love of God. It's the merchant man who found the pearl of great price. And he went and sold all that he had. You know who that is? That's Jesus. He gave all that he had that he might purchase us. That's the love of God. Well, I got two thoughts here. If you got if you got something to write this with, write this down. Number one, love works to find a way to show it. Love is always if the when the love of God is in your heart, you're always compelled by the love of God to show it, to manifest it to other people. You 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 just feel like you just got to share it. You're all the time trying to figure out how can I get the love of God out to other people? You're all the time trying to come up with ways and what can we do as a church and what can we do as a, a husband or a wife or, or neighbor or friend? How can we show the love of God greater and manifest it around us? The love of God is not something that once you've got it in your heart, you just sit on a shelf and say, oh boy, don't that feel good? <laughs> It's not about us. It, it, it's, always, it's always about other people. Amen. It's selfless. It's generous. It's sacrificial. It's compassionate. It's forgiving. It's respectful. It's understanding of others. The story of old Norwegian probably a good Lutheran who, who had immigrated to the States. It's 1906. He, he is there along the lake shore at a big picnic and his, and his girlfriend Bess is there. And you know what? He's just, he'll do anything for Bess. I mean, she just says jump. He'll jump. And, and, and she, she said, I, I hear they've got ice cream on the other side of the lake. <laughs> and all, all, He'd do anything. He got in a rowboat. And he rowed down the lake and back five miles round trip. And he got back and old, good old Bess, she's waiting on him. She wants some ice cream. And he brought it, but now it's all melted. But oh, he loves her. He'll do anything he, to show her he loves her. And so, oh, he, he's mechanically minded, you know, you know, and he spent the year thinking about this. And next year to picnic, oh, Evan Rood has got an answer to all of this. <laughs> he has devised over the winter months a little outboard motor. <laughs> and uh, uh, Bess took a look at that, and then now, oh, can go get the ice cream. <laughs> And uh, she says, this guy's going somewhere with that, and she married him. And when Evan Rude Motors went into business, she got to write the advertising slogan, said, throw the oars away. 
Oh, all for ice cream. The things we do for love. We just trip all over ourselves, you know, to just to show it and prove it. How much we love somebody. We, we want to show it. And let me tell you something, church. When the love of God is in your heart, when the Lord has done something in your life, you will trip all over yourself to share that everywhere you go. This past week at assembly and all the pastors got up. I took my turn too. We all had to share. How will we reach in our community for Christ? And we heard glorious stories about food ministries and giving coats away to children and tutoring kids after school and counseling and on and on and on because the love of God's in our heart and we want to share it with the world. And, and how do you get that out of our heart and into the neighborhood? And if we are listening to the Holy Spirit, He will nudge you. He'll nudge you to go across the street. He'll nudge you to talk to that person in the store. He'll nudge you to do something because it's not about us, just only us. It's always about somebody else, isn't it? Number two, love goes beyond the normal bounds of what is acceptable and what is predictable. Not only does God work in our lives to impact others, but he pushes us out of our comfort zones into areas that many would call foolish and the impractical and outlandish. And somebody says, but that costs too much money. <laughs> somebody says, well, that'll make me look stupid. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do it, it's not, it's not stupid. Amen. It's the wisdom of God. And if you follow through, you look back and say, that was the best thing I ever did in my life, was follow what God was telling me to do. It's anything but normal. The, see, the standard is not us, is it? The standard, the standard is found in 1 John 4 that said, Herein is love, not that we love God, but He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation or substitute for our sins. There is nothing normal or predictable about a man hanging on a cross, is there? There's nothing normal or predictable about a man dying for the sins of the world. But that's what the love of God will do. And he's forever pushing the boundaries of what you and I should be doing, could be doing, because it's, it's God's ideas first. Before it's ever our idea, it's always God's. And through the power of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, think about this. Hey, think about that. It's, it's like the couple I read about this week by the name of Christine and Kyle Kramer. Because when they got married, they broke the mold on the reception. I'm serious. They broke the mold. I have never heard this before. May never hear of it again. They had a wedding and they had a very tiny reception. There was a little bit of food. But what they had done was all that big expense that they had planned for the reception. And that gets expensive. You haven't been to a wedding lately and priced what it costs to feed people. It's expensive. That wedding that we went, Rob and I went to in Nashville. I was sitting there and I nudged Rob and I said, boy, I'm glad I ain't paying for this. <laughs> this, this oh, I'm counting heads. And what each plate costs, you know... Uh, catered in, I'm like, wow. God help them. You know what You know what this couple did? All that money they would have spent, they paid to have a truckload of groceries brought in. And when that little meal they had, quick little simple meal they had with guests, they all went to work and they boxed up groceries to feed the hungry in their neighborhood. And that's what they did. That's not normal, is it? That's not predictable, but that's what the love of God will do. And they said the first thing we want to do as a married couple is serve others. Isn't that incredible? It's like the little girl I read about, a teenager, headed on a mission trip to Jamaica with pastor, a small group that was going, and they were going to, going to put together a playground for a school for the deaf in Jamaica. And uh, they'd planned this for months. And the pastor got a phone call. Pastor Dave got a phone call. And the gal, teenager, wants to meet with him. And he's thinking, oh, no, she's going to cancel at the last minute. And, ah, oh, that's just going to throw a monkey wrench to all of this. So he meets with them for lunch at the fast food joint. And the girl's there with her mom. They sat down. He said, all right, what's, what's on your heart? And she said, the, the Lord's been dealing with me all week. I've been praying about this trip. 
He said, you're not going to go. She said, no, I'm going to go, but I want, the Lord has laid on my heart, that my savings account, my entire savings account, I've been saving for a car. I want to, I want to cash it all in. I want to give it to, to this trip, and I want to use every penny of it for the mission trip. Folks, that's not normal. That's not predictable. But that's what the love of God will do when it's in your heart and what the Holy Spirit will do with us if we just listen. <clears throat> There's like a man that I read about, and I have to read this because I can't get the name just right, Hathams. His marriage proposal to his wife, Mary, was the last and the least romantic of the three proposals she had had received by other men. He said, I think I love you. And I want you to be my wife, but I want to tell you my, my life plan. His desire was to leave the, ministry, leave the ministry work in Lebanon and go back to Iraq and to preach the gospel. And he said, most likely, I will be living a harder life than the average person. He's prepared for her to say no and to reject him. He understood that living as a Christian in a war-torn, predominantly Muslim country was not every Christian's calling, but his devotion was to that calling. But that's exactly what Mary was hoping to hear. That's what she had been praying for. She said, my prayer was, Lord, I want you to send somebody who is dedicated to you, so dedicated to you, and that's the one I want to marry. And here was a man saying, I want you to follow me into the ministry in Iraq to preach the gospel. It's a long story. He will end up shot. He will have to recover in Lebanon. Today he's in a wheelchair, but he is still preaching the gospel. It's a hard life. It's what God called him to. And it's what God called Mary to. And they're following the will of God. Folks, there's nothing predictable about that. And there's nothing normal about that according to the world scheme. If you want to know what's normal, go back to verse 19. He said, here's the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness, rebellings. That's what's normal in the world. Some of us live that way before we came to Christ. That's what is normal for the world. But then Paul says, but, verse 22, but, however, here's what is normal for Christians, filled with the Holy Ghost. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. And if you will stay surrendered to God, He will bring all this out in your life. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and patience, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and self-control, or temperance. That's normal for Christians. How you doing with that? Are you as loving as God wants you to be? We, we tend to love the people that are like us. We tend to love the people that love us. We, we tend to love the people that we are used to, but he's forever pushing us out of our boundaries and safe zones and saying, but I want you to love somebody else. I want you to care about somebody that maybe doesn't care for you. I want you to pray for somebody that wouldn't even think about praying for us. You need to pray this morning. God, help me to be more loving. God, help me to surrender to you. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might be more loving. God, use me. God, forgive me for not being loving. And God, help me to do it your way. I'm going to ask us to stand. There's, there's a little hymn in your hymnal, page 707, I believe. I'm going to ask Ed if he'd come to the organ and and uh, we're going we're gonna to sing this. If you'd like to come and pray at an altar this morning, and you'd like to just say, God, help me to be more loving. God, use me to be more loving. God, forgive me for not being more loving. God, whatever you need to do. Page 707. We won't tarry long, but if you would like to come and pray, you, you, 
feel free to do so. for our sins that we might have life and life abundant. Father, we rejoice today in that salvation. But we pray, Lord, you continue to work on us and shape us and mold us more into the image of Jesus, that, Father, that every day all things pass away, all things are become new. Father, bless your people, Lord, as we go out into the world. May we walk in the Spirit. May we share in the Spirit. May the power of God be over us, quicken us and enable us to be your people in a world that's dying without you. Yes. We pray that in the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you for being here today. Go out and be faithful and serve Him. Yeah.